my opinion, one of the least productive Congresses in history. But uh, we did uh, finally and belatedly come up with a, uh, a highway bill, a service transportation bill. Uh, you know, our roads, bridges, and highways are falling apart. Uh, we were given a tremendous gift in the last century, starting in the Eisenhower era with the National Highway Program. Uh, and then later on, uh, actually, Ronald Reagan added in uh, mass transit into the, uh, the trust fund. And we made a lot of investment, uh, move people more efficiently, save fuel. Uh, a lot of the systems had its useful life. Uh, 50, 60 years. We have 150,000 bridges on the federal system need repair or replacements. 40% of the pavement needs to be dug up, not just overlaid, uh, needs new base. And we have about a $70 billion backlog on our transit vehicles just to bring them up to state of good repair, uh, let alone build out a 21st century efficient uh, transportation system like most of our competitor nations are doing. Uh, to me, this is one of the principal and fundamental uh, obligations of government, uh, starting with George Washington, who was interested in canals, Lincoln, railroads, and then, as I said, Eisenhower and so forth. It's in a great tradition. Unfortunately, there's been a number of members of Congress elected recently who don't believe that the federal government has any role to play in funding or maintaining a national system of transportation, which is kind of an odd thing to think of, but they believe in what they call devolution. That's why I have this chart here. That is, the 50 states individually and the territories should do our national transportation system. Now, we actually tried this. Uh, this is 1956. Uh, this is the brand spanking new Kansas Turnpike. And as you can see, it ends rather oddly. <laughs> this is Amos Schweitzer's Field, and this is the Oklahoma State Line. <laughs> Oklahoma uh, did not deliver on their promised extension uh, of the highway until after the uh, Eisenhower legislation passed and they could get uh, federal assistance in building the road. Uh, so, you know, to me, go back to these good old days which never existed would not be a, a great idea. And if the federal government isn't going to participate, that would obviously mean a huge proliferation of uh, tolling and other burdens on the individual states and the system. So uh, we fought over this for more than 18 months. Uh, and finally, Speaker Boehner told the 80 or so who didn't believe in this, he was going forward anyway. And, and we got a pretty decent bill. It's pretty much status quo. It'll put uh, a lot of people to work. Uh, it'll begin to help repair the system. It won't get us up to a state of good repair. It also contained a one-year extension of lower interest rates on federal direct student loans. Uh, I would like to permanently fix that problem, and we could do that by merely raising the top tax rate by 1%. Uh, it would still be lower than Clinton era rates. If people on over $350,000 a year paid 1% more in federal taxes, we could give students a permanent, uh, you know, lower rate on their loans. And last year, young Oregonians borrowed a billion and a half dollars to go to community college and college in this state uh, and across the country. This is it's becoming a big problem, the amount of debt our kids are graduating with. And then the third thing uh, in this bill was uh, county payments. Beyond that, uh, I don't expect uh, much out of the rest of this Congress. It wasn't particularly productive before then. It's not going to be very productive uh, in the fall. We have very few legislative days left, and everybody's just looking at the next election and figuring that'll sort of settle things uh, one way or another. Um, there's a couple other issues. I mean, you know, as I said, my focus on, on transportation infrastructure and that is jobs. Uh, there's another reason why we're shy of jobs in this country, uh, which would be our trade deficit. Uh, and. We unfortunately have a very bipartisan problem when it comes to trade. Uh, you know, Ronald Reagan started the negotiations for free trade agreement with Mexico, uh, and it was finally concluded when Clinton was president. Clinton signed it and pushed it through Congress. Uh, I objected uh, very strongly to it, and what we saw was instead of a bunch of jobs in the U.S., was a flood of jobs in Mexico where they could get people to work for a buck an hour. And that lasted for a while until they found out they could get people to work for a buck a day in China. Uh, and a lot of the companies that have moved to Mexico then moved to uh, China. Uh, and you can see uh, our trade deficit here. This is not sustainable. We can't keep borrowing money from the rest of the world to buy things that we used to make in America anymore. We're losing our middle class. We're losing our manufacturing base. Uh, and we need to start making things here again. Uh, this was this last year, just because the economy is kind of depressed, our trade deficit is down. 
Uh, but when you look here, the last really good year of the economy before the Wall Street crash, we had an almost $800 billion trade deficit. That means we borrowed more than $2 billion a year from around the world to buy stuff that we used to make here. Can't work. Uh, there's, a, unfortunately, another pending free trade agreement called the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, you know, I'm opposed to it. Uh, and we'll just see that's one of the many issues that they're talking about voting on in the lame duck session after the election. I hope not, because some of our worst trade deals have happened in lame duck sessions of Congress. NAFTA, WTO, uh, and others have all happened in lame duck sessions of Congress, and, and I'll, be, uh, I'll be opposing that. We need a new trade policy, a trade policy that brings in, uh, jobs home and keeps them home here in the U.S. And then sort of the third major aspect hanging over us is debt. Uh, we have a huge, huge mountain of debt. Uh, I voted uh, early this year as the lead Democratic sponsor of a balanced budget amendment. Uh, it was neutral between revenues and cuts. Uh, it just said you get eight years uh, to bring about a balanced budget on stop accumulating a massive amount of debt. Uh, and unfortunately, it, it failed. We passed one very similar to that in 1996. And if the uh, one that passed the House in 96 had passed the Senate, failed by one vote. Uh, and we had adopted a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution in the surplus years of the Clinton administration, the last years of his presidency. Today would be paying off the last of our debt. In fact, when George Bush came in, he said, we're going to have, we're going to be paying off the debt in six or seven years. Uh, what will people do, you know, if we pay off the debt? So he pushed through the massive Bush tax cuts. And uh, we're, uh, you know, we're continue those, and Obama has added on top of that some Obama tax cuts, which are going to lower income people and working people because it's a break in the Social Security tax, but still costs $150 billion a year. So, uh, you know, we're really at this point at a point where we've got to get serious both about revenues and debts. Now, there's a big argument in Washington that the job creators can't afford to pay more taxes. <laughs> Remember, in the, in the Clinton years, 3.8% unemployment, the job creators, those people at the top, over 250,000, paid almost 40% in taxes. Uh, today, they're paying uh, an average rate because a lot of their income is capital gains of about 15, and their nominal top tax rate is still considerably less than in the Clinton era. We've been trying tax cuts to put people back to work for 10 years. Uh, I don't think it's working. I think some targeted investment uh, would be a better way of putting people back to work. Look at the most productive growth years in our country. Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, uh, up until uh, you know this era here, relatively high tax rates, uh, as high as under Eisenhower and Truman, up in the 90% for the people at the top. I think it's a little high, but uh, the point is to say that uh, they can't afford another 3% to help deal with the deficit uh, is uh, something, again, that will be debated in December because all of the Bush and Obama tax cuts expire in December and they'll be all up for uh, legislation or not. And uh, we'll see how, how that works out. Uh, it's really got to be a combination of both spending reduction and, uh, and revenues that's going to get us out of this. If you eliminated the entire federal government today, Okay, just imagine, there's no Pentagon, there's no Border Patrol, there's no Coast Guard, there's no federal prisons, there's, you know, there's nothing. There's no federal government, we just have state and local government. Uh, there would still be a deficit. That's how big the problem is. So to say, well, we'll just cut a little bit or we'll eliminate a few departments of the government, that's not going to get us there. Yes, uh, we should consider those things and we should become more efficient, we should spend less, but we also have to talk about reasonable and fair revenues. So. Um, that's, uh, that's about it. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to take questions. So let's, where's my water bottle going? Over there. Okay. Yes? Um, Mr. DePlaus, we thank you for your service. And uh, I've seen firsthand what EPA's ethanol production requirement has done to food prices in poor nations. Uh, we're personally involved in India and uh, in orphanages and schools and also in a deaf school in Mexico. And with the implementation of EPA's requirement, food prices in these nations have more than doubled, quietly starving many, and creating a much greater burden for these struggling organizations. And then with the drought this year, the livestock farmers recently pleaded to the EPA to um, waive the 40% <coughs> corn crop requirement 
that now goes to ethanol production. <coughs> Without this waiver, food prices will skyrocket, raising the prices for meat, uh, causing more poverty here and in developing nations. And uh, the Obama administration said no. And I wanted to know your position on this and what you uh, hope to do about it. Well, I'm not an ethanol fan and never have been. Uh, I oppose the subsidies, which we finally got rid of, but there's still a mandate, as you pointed out. Uh, in fact, the EPA has been considering an E15 or an E20 mandate, uh, which I think would be a big mistake. Uh, ethanol at its best is uh, probably a slight loser in terms of energy costs, let alone the impact it has over here on food, as you pointed mm -hmm. out. Uh, I supported the waiver requirement, do away with the uh, ethanol requirement <coughs> due to the drought. Uh, I didn't, I wasn't aware that the EPA had already made a decision to tell the truth. I thought it was still pending, but maybe... I have uh, a, yeah. a article in the paper I could... Yeah, well, I, I, may, I may have missed that. I've been out of Washington for 10 days, so I'm not quite as attentive <laughs> to what's going on back there when I'm not there. Uh, I try and forget about it, actually. <laughs> so, uh, you know, anyway, I'm, I'm totally supportive. I understand what you're talking about. Um, you know, there are much more promising uh, renewable alternate fuels. Uh, if you want to do ethanol, it should be cellulosic ethanol. Uh, if you want to, more promising is biodiesel. Uh, biodiesel can be produced out of uh, waste products, wood products, uh, and other things. Uh, there are much more promising ways and beyond that, part of the original rationale was to cut our dependence on foreign oil. Actually, this year, last year, for the first time since 1949, the United States exported more fuel and fuel distillates than we imported. So uh, the whole idea, I mean, yes, we're still importing a substantial amount, but we're exporting a tremendous amount, too. So, uh, you know, it really sort of the original rationale, I mean, there was first that people said, well, it was cleaner, or it did this, it did I mean, there's been a whole bunch of reasons to have the ethanol. I mean, the bottom line was there were a bunch of the farmers in the Midwest liked it for a while, uh, you know, but not the people who have cattle or hogs or other things. So, um, I, you know, I would still hope they'll waive it or Congress could act to waive it uh, in the waning days of, of the session, and I think it would be a wise thing to do, particularly with, you know, the exacerbation of the drought. Thank you. So, sure. Yes, ma'am. Well, that's one thing I don't understand is I can see trying uh, the ethanol uh, idea. If an idea does not end up working out, how come there's no contingency for, oh, that didn't work, so we're going to claw it back and not do it anymore? Well, you've got a big ethanol lobby now, uh, you know, a bunch of people build ethanol plants. With the argument, the EPA said, you know, the EPA was considering, a number of us urged EPA to consider this waiver. And because the, the law Congress wrote said, if there's to be economic harm from this ethanol mandate, you know, uh, or, you know, around the mandate, then they could waive it. Well, when the EPA started the discussion, all the people who build ethanol plants came in and said, wait a minute, you want to talk about economic harm? We made these huge investments with a captive market, and now you're going to tell us that we don't get to make ethanol. So, or we're going to have to pay, you know, you know they, they could still make it, but there would be no mandate for anybody to use it, which would probably mean there would be much, much lower utilization. So, um, you know, that's, that these things get a life of, life of their own. The farmers loved it, so there's a huge Midwestern farm lobby. They liked it because corn prices were at record. Uh, the people who were producing and selling the ethanol liked it. The oil companies liked it because it was cheaper. You know, they, they, you know, they, were, they were making money off the ethanol addition to the, the uh, gasoline product. So, you know, there's, once these things get going, they get a life of their own. And, and Congress doesn't spend enough time reviewing things it's already created. Uh, and saying, wait a minute, that's not working. But we, a number of us have raised this issue about whether this is working or not working over the last four or five years, both when the Democrats were in charge and when the Republicans were in charge. We did do away with the subsidy, at least, for the ethanol, but the mandate remained. Couldn't, well, couldn't we get the mandate. Really 